Well, thanks for coming. Let's uh, let's go around the table and let everybody introduce themselves to one another so that uh, um, as we study so you guys work together, we're gonna you know we're gonna grow together and then it's good to know one another and hopefully build some relationships here. So you know starts. Uh, I'm not just man. Yep, just your name right here. I'm Jeremy Jacobson. I'm originally from here, not so Okay. Uh, Matthew Paul. I'm from Okay. Yeah, just here. Excellent. Good morning. Good morning. I'm coming to you from Michigan. And it's snowing. So, and, and Bob texted he said the time is right. So, we here in that um, and hopefully the others will show up. But let's, let's start with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to study your own word today, bless us through it. Send your Holy Spirit to uh, help us understand your word and, and answer our questions that we can grow in our relationship with you and with one another. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, you've all got one of those binders, and uh, um, those are yours to keep. Uh, so feel free to write notes in it and uh, whatever else. It, it may be helpful down the road as you know, you're talking about something with friends. And, um, well, we talk with that in class and we look at some of the passages. Because basically what it is, is it's an outline with a whole bunch of other questions about specific topics with different subjects. Um, so, hey, Bob. So we are, we just started, um, and you got that book there, that, that's yours to keep. We'll use that as kind of our, our discussion. The goal of this class um, is to get your questions answered about God's Word. Um, I believe that the Bible is God's Word. That, uh, I know not everybody believes that. Um, and, and that's okay, I'm not going to logically convince anyone because I understand it's kind of a circular argument. You know, I believe in God, but if the Bible says this is who God is, and I believe that the Bible is God's word because I believe in God, he says he gave me said it in the Bible. So if someone is saying, well, I don't believe the Bible is God's word, and you kind of break that circular argument, then oh well. But really it's a matter of faith, right? God works in our hearts. Um, and so I'll start with that. I believe the Bible is God's word. My goal in this class is to demonstrate what the Bible says about things. Because there's a lot of different teachings out there, right? Different people say different things, and they say this is what God wants, or that's what God wants. Um, if I'm going based on what I feel, or what I've been taught, or even what makes sense to me, or what my grandma always said, those things might be nice, but there's really no certainty there. Because grandma could have been wrong. I know my feelings might be misled. Um, so the goal is always to say, this is what scripture says. And then I'll leave between you and God for you know whether whether you believe that or not. Um, but my goal is always going to be answering questions based on here's what it says in the Bible. Um, make sense? And this is per the Lutheran perspective. Yeah, so um, and, and really. Even, even beyond, so I, I am a Lutheran. I, 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 uh, because I believe what the Bible says, I believe the Lutheran church, the big thing is go back to where I got, right? Um, and so, but the goal is not to say this is what one church or another teaches. The goal is to say this is why. This is where it is in Scripture. Um, and here's how we get these questions answered. And, and this class gets interesting when you guys ask questions. Um, we could make it through these lessons probably pretty quickly, just you know, reading the passages and moving on. Um, but it's the questions that make it interesting. And sometimes we'll go off on tangents, and sometimes we'll take longer on a section than, than anyone might have expected, and sometimes we'll read through a section. Um, if you're sitting here and feel a little bit bored, that's because you're asking different questions. So ask, ask the question. Uh, that way, I didn't I did no blame for it, right? <laughs> no, but uh, um, I encourage you if you're thinking it, ask it because 
Shanks or someone else is thinking that same question, or they didn't think to think that question. And uh, you can help us out by, by doing that. Uh, the passages that are printed in this book are from the New International Version translation. Uh, there's a lot of great translations out there. Maybe you like the King James, maybe you like the, the ESV, maybe you like the CSV, whatever, great. Um, I'm not saying it has to be this one, but just for consistency so we can be reading the same thing. I agree to those, but feel free to have your own Bible and look it up to whatever translation you like. Because um, our goal is to be growing and understanding of God's word. Um, and yeah, that's that. I think that's kind of the, the background. There's a, a page inside your front cover that says my questions that need to be answered. Uh, I put that in there just because of what I found to happen to me way too often. Um, I might be doing something and thinking, you know what? I gotta ask Bob this next time I see him. And the next time I see Bob, I may remember, oh, there was something I was gonna ask you. But the chances of me actually remembering what I was gonna ask you, not so not as great. So uh, I put that in there. If you're thinking about something, if something comes up during the week, um, write it down. And uh, then when we start class, each class, I'm gonna start by asking if you had any questions that you came up with that week. And that usually serves as kind of our, our review of what we talked about, and then we get into the, into the new stuff. Um, so again, if I stressed enough, I want you to ask your questions. Uh, this is a, a great chance to, to get those answered. Um, and with that, we can, we can start. Um, you see uh, in the table of contents, there's 11 chapters. I've told you that there's 12 lessons. It's because one of the chapters always takes two weeks. And it's got you know baptism and Lord's Supper uh, um, in there, so it'll, it'll usually be 12 weeks, uh, 12 lessons. I'm not too concerned if we you know don't get all the way through a lesson <laughs> we'll the next time and keep going, or if we you know some of the lessons are really short and I kind of plan on going into the next one. But, um, but we'll start with chapter one, and and that might sound really basic. Oh, yeah, can you admit him? Yeah. My, they kicked me off again. Um, so, yeah, why don't you take that keyboard and yeah, I mean, the, the... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But... That's all right. Uh, but I didn't be trying on there all day. Um, hey, Brian. Can you hear us okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Good. So you guys have the, the book, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So I was just telling them this class is, is going to be based on your questions, so make sure that you, you ask them. Uh, and, and feel free, if, I don't, if I'm not looking at the screen and I don't see you, uh, just, just jump in and, uh, and ask your question and interrupt me. I'm, I'm uh, not going to be offended. Um, we want to hear those questions. So, let's see here. Yeah, this is not. I think I can have the same idea. Let's see if that works. Yeah. So, if my computer here works, you'll see my face. Otherwise, you get to see the back of my head. Um, so, we are in chapter one, and we start with something really basic Is there a God? Um, I'm guessing. I know the answer most of you would give to that, right? You're at a, a class studying God. Um, so yeah, there's a guy. But I'm also guessing that there's probably some of you know that uh, um, might not be so sure about that. Or maybe you've gone through times where you, you've wondered about that question. And so how do you answer that? How do you prove to someone there's a God? I can say, well, there's a God, because I believe it. OK, that doesn't really help me much, right? Well, there's a God to the Bible says so. What's the Bible? What's the book God gave us? Well, if God doesn't exist, why would I think that there's a book he gave me? You know, so, so how do you prove it without the Bible? Because the Bible is how God describes himself to us. Um, then the Bible gives you some help there. How do you answer that question, is there a God? Well, he says, look around. Um, look at the, the first one, the natural knowledge of God. So the belief in God is actually logical. And then we talk about why that is. And so I've got a bunch of passages there. What we'll do is um, I do the player pass method. Uh, if, if you want to read, great. If you don't want to read, great. 
Um, and, and let me explain that this way. Uh, if someone asks me to read something out loud that I did not prepare, uh, you know, I haven't read it before, I'm not ready for it. When I'm reading this, all I'm thinking about is, am I saying this right? Like, you know, what's the next word? And I'm not really comprehending much. Um, I do better if I hear someone else read it. It's something new. Um, if that's you, ask. Other people learn better by reading out loud and, and hearing themselves. And, and so if that's you, go ahead and play. So I always go around the, the room and uh, I give you guys the player pass. So Jeremy, what do you think? He was three, four, you want to play or pass? Um, I'll play. All right. For every house is built by someone, God is the builder of everything. Okay. Uh, you know, you walk into a house and you can tell that there's a plan, right? That someone built it. You know, and when you came into this church, uh, I'm pretty certain that when you walked in, you didn't say to yourself, you know what, I bet you there was a tomato that came to the forest that used to be here, and it threw all the stones and wood and everything together and out pop this church. Um, you, you see it and you realize, okay, there, there's a design here. Someone planned it, someone got the materials together, someone did it, just by looking at it. And right after Hebrews there, making the point, um, look at the, uh, the, the way things work and, and how there is order and structure and, um, you know, the, the, the trees make fruit that, that produce seed that, you know, another tree grows. Yeah, but uh, nothing. I'm just in second training. The guy's driving watching. Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, all right. So, yeah, so we've got, uh, uh, you, you look at nature and he says, you can see there's, there's some order, right? So, something made this. Uh, Romans one twenty talks about that. Matthew, you want to play a pass? Uh, All right. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, the eternal power of divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that later on that was excused. Okay. So he says, since the world's been here, two things have been clear, right? Um, God's eternal power and his divine nature. Um, he says, just by looking at what we see, you, uh, you can tell it. Um, so you know, think about that, his eternal power. In other words, uh, there's something bigger than us, right? There's something more powerful than us. And divine nature, in other words, different than us, right? God. Um, I'm sorry for my distraction, I'm trying to get this, this done as well. Um, so yeah, so you look around, you can tell there's something bigger, there, there's something that's not us. Uh, Psalm 19, 1, that's my, my camping verse. Um, you ever go camping? You ever go camping? Away, away from away all the... All the city lights. Uh, and you, you wake up in the middle of the night and uh, look outside at the stars. And you, you actually see the stars, the billions of stars that are out there. And there's really, you can't do anything but just say, wow. Right? Or maybe for you it's a mountain path or an ocean. You look out. You say, wow, that, that's declaring the glory of God. It is saying, you know, there's something bigger out here. So much so that Psalm 14 says, the fool says, it's not just God. If you say there's no God, you're fooling yourself. Um, any questions there on that natural knowledge of God? So you tell someone, hey, look around. Come on, that proves there's something bigger. But I've had people tell me, no, it doesn't. That just proves that, you know, over. Billions of years, this all came about, and this is what it is. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so then when you say that, how do you prove that there's a God? But my next question is usually, okay, have you ever felt guilty? Um, and for all the times I've asked that, I've only gotten one answer, right? Of course. Everyone's felt guilty at, at one point or another. So then my question is why? If there isn't a God, if there isn't someone that we're answering to, why would I ever feel guilty? Um, well, that's what this, this next section goes with. Bob, do you want to go on to 14? Do you want to play your best? Um, okay. <laughs> on to 14. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law, do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. 
since they show that the terms of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience is also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending. Okay. Kind of a complex sentence in there, right? But it's kind of walk through that. So he says, Gentiles, so for the people of Polite, for the Jews of Polite, there were two kinds of people in the world. There were Jews and everyone else. Right? So those are the Gentiles. So he says the Gentiles, they don't have the law, right? They didn't have the Old Testament, they didn't have the priests, they didn't have the temple, they didn't have the prophets. Um, but he said, even though they didn't have that, they still did the things the law required. You know, so you, you look at all the different uh, law codes throughout history, whether it's you know Hammurabi or Stradol or, or whatever. There's some similarities, right? You don't murder, you don't steal, you don't rape. I mean, people get that. They're, they're right and wrong. Um, and the, the letter to Romans here talks about how that demonstrated something. People understand that there is right and wrong, that there are things you should do and things you, you don't do. And, and he says that proves something. That proves that that law is written on our hearts. You know, God, God took that on our hearts. And he says our conscience is testified to it, right? You know, when we do something wrong, our conscience says, hey, that was wrong. When we do something right, our conscience says, no, that was right. We did they say. Um, that's, it's in us. Uh, Victor, you want to John on it? Sure, I'll play it. And if we claim to do without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Okay. Uh, if I say I've never sinned, I'm not. Pastor? Pastor? Yes. It is getting really it hard to hear you. Really Okay. Is there a way to is there a way to speak to the audio? audio? Yes. Um, let's see here. Uh, Victor, do you want to mute that? Just mute. Can you hear that better, Cap? How about now? Okay, you're on mute. Let me hear you uh, talk. Much better. Yeah. And now it's doing that again. Okay. Test one, two. Yeah, I'm trying to turn this off. It's a little angle, but it is better. All right. When do you want to talk? Is that better? You want to take this outside? Try that. Okay. Sorry for technical difficulties, but okay. So we were we were talking about uh, you know so Romans three twenty three all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So so we've got we've got two things that people by nature understand, right? That uh, one there is something bigger than me out there. I might not call it God. I might not you know admit to what or who it is, but we have that sense that there's something bigger. Uh, and, and then the other thing, our conscience tells us that we've messed up, right? That's the natural knowledge of God. It says that there is something out there, something that I'm answerable to. Um, and so that kind of leads to a problem, right? If there's someone more powerful than me and I've ticked them off, um, that's an issue. I got to do something to fix that, right? Uh, that's where the natural knowledge of God leaves us, um, where, you know, you, you turn the page uh, it talks about how our natural knowledge is not sufficient for salvation. It just tells us that there is a God. Uh, it's the revealed knowledge, so the Bible, that shows us who that God is. Um, Psalm 96, verse 5. Lynette, you want that one? Can you guys hear the people in this room when it's on my computer? Yeah? Okay. Barely. I can. Okay, good. Good. Um, yeah, so all the gods of the nations are idols. The, um, there were a lot of different gods in the nations around 
the Israelites, right? There was there was Molech and Baal and Asherah, and they had their temples and their shrines and their their priests and priestesses and and all of that. Um, and and it seemed like there was something there. But notice what he's saying here: the gods of the nations are idols. The the Hebrew word there is chevel, which ha- is kind of it's like a mist, right? You know, you go outside on a cold morning and you can see your breath, and, and it looks like there's something, but there's really nothing behind it. That that's that word. So the gods of the nations, it might look like there's something there, but, but there's nothing behind it. And he says, contrast that, the Lord made the heavens. Um, you know, th- there's a difference there. In, in Acts 17, this is Paul talking about that, uh, that knowledge of God and how we know about him. Um, and I won't read that whole thing. You can kind of scan through it. But uh, uh, this is, so Paul, a great missionary in the early church, um, he is going from town to town and telling people about Jesus and starting these congregations on his missionary journeys. And uh, he was usually getting persecuted for it. The, the, some of the powers that be and some of the religious establishment didn't like him, uh, you know, taking their attention. And so they would try to get rid of him. And so he was, you know, stoned. He was left for dead. He was arrested. He was beaten, all this. Uh, so in one of these cities, he's, uh, he's, uh, in a house and the his enemies come and surround the house and they're waiting for morning when he comes out they're going to kill him um, during the night he climbs out the window and and uh, uh flees to athens so he's in athens now he's waiting for his partners to come join him there and uh, um, uh, help him in the work and while he's waiting he's walking up and down the streets of athens he's talking to people he's he's doing what he does he talks about jesus and Athens was well known for philosophy, right? Any, if you know any famous philosophers, chances are they're from Athens, right? Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Uh, they, they liked thinking about thinking. Um, and some of these guys heard Paul talking about Jesus and the resurrection. And, and they're like, huh, we haven't heard anything like that before. You should come to our meeting. So they invite him to this meeting of the Areopagus so that he can tell them his philosophy and then they can tell him whether he's crazy or not. Um, so, so he comes there and, and uh, skip down to about verse 22. It says, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. If you've ever been to uh, Athens, I haven't, but uh, I've heard, um, you know, the, the archaeologists have uncovered just countless religious shrines, right? Altars and temples and everything else. If you've seen pictures of, of Athens, you've probably seen uh, some of those. Um, they were serious about religion and they had all their bases covered. He says, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. In other words, you know, they had, they had their God of war and their goddess of fertility and their God of the harvest and their goddess of water and their, you know, all of these different gods and goddesses. And then they even had one, uh, just in case we missed you, here you are. Because think about how that, that religion works, right? Um, two things or, or, you know, two things seem to be the same, but, but different things happen. So maybe, maybe two couples are both trying to have kids. Right? And one has no problem and the other um, just problem after problem. Well, they look the same. What's the difference? It must be the gods, right? They must have displeased. So if you offer this offering to the goddess of fertility, then everything will be great. Or two nations are, are going to war and it looks like this one's more powerful, but this one ends up winning. Well, how did that happen? Well, it must be the gods. So if we offer a sacrifice, maybe the god of war will, will help us win next time. Um, and so, you know, all of these, because... They're coming from that natural knowledge, right? The feeling that there's something bigger than me and I've messed up, so I got to fix it. Uh, what can I do? I can offer this sacrifice. I can bring this offering. I can go to this temple. Um, and, and so they had these for all the different facets of life. And then even, hey, in case we missed you, here's one for the unknown God. And then Paul says, what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. Right? When we look at the natural knowledge, we we don't know the answers. Uh, we need God to give us the answers. And that's what he does with his word. Um, but the purpose of the natural knowledge is to make us look for those answers. Uh, look at Acts 17, 
Let's see, Kat, you wanna play or pass? I'll play. All right. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that man or men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of them. Okay. So God made everything. He determined the time set for, for people. I mean, you think about it. Um, did anyone in this room know each other before today? Yeah, no. Okay, yeah. Um, think, of, think of all the little things that happened that somehow you find yourself in this room studying God's word with this group of people. Right, you know, maybe, maybe it was big things. Maybe maybe something drastic happened in life. Maybe it was a little thing. A friend gave you an invitation, or someone showed up at your door. Uh, maybe maybe uh, you had a setback at work, so you were thinking about something, and then God gave an answer. And and you know, all these little things that happen. God says, "Oh yeah, I did that." Uh, he 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 put all of these things in our path so that we would be looking for answers. And, and notice it says He's not far from us. Right, His word is right here. Um, but he arranges our lives so that we're looking for those answers. Um, you know, everybody needs a relationship with God. That's, that's what we were created for. That's why we were created as a species, uh, as a race, to, be, to, be, to have a relationship with God. But not everybody understands that. But we all know that need, right? Some people try to fill that void with money or drugs or alcohol, or parties, or family, or, you know, uh, all sorts of different things, either good or bad, we try to fill that, that void. Um, but let's say if, if I'm, if I'm saying, okay, I'll be happy, I'll be fulfilled once I'm a millionaire. Um, you guys know how it goes. What happens once I get a million dollars? What's that? I need two now, right? It, it, it's not enough. I always need more. You know, there was a, a survey of the richest 2% of Atlantans, and one of the questions asked um, was, uh, are, are you financially comfortable? Um, and then, you know, what would it take to make you financially comfortable? So these are people that are making more than I'm ever going to see in my life every year, probably every month. I mean, the, it's, it's multimillionaires. Um, and like 14% of them said, I'm financially comfortable. The other 86% of people who have more money than I could ever dream of having say, no, nope, not enough. Um, whatever we're going for, if, if I try to fill my, my fulfillment with parties or with friends or popularity, I'm always going to need more. Um, there's an old saying, uh, it's a prayer written by a guy, what, 1700 years ago. He wrote, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they find rest in you. Right? We have this need for God. And until that is filled, we're just going to be chasing after everything else. But he said he put that in there so we're looking for him, so that he can give us the answers. Because the natural knowledge only leads to one of two outcomes. Either I realize there's something more powerful than me, and I, I, I know I've messed up, so i got to do something to fix it. So it's a life of constantly trying to do enough, always wondering if I'm doing enough. Or I just say, you know what, I don't want to bother with that, and I try to tell myself God doesn't exist. Neither of those end well. Um, God's the one who gives the answer and his revealed knowledge. Uh, John 3, 16. Uh, Nicole, you want to play or pass on that? Um, I'll play. Awesome. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Oh, son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Thank you. Uh, you've probably heard that passage before, right? Um, but, but think about it. You, you would not have guessed that, going by the natural knowledge, right? Something more powerful than me, I've ticked him off. I would guess, okay, he's going to punish me, right? Or I got to do something to make up for it. Not he's going to punish his own son. He's going to sacrifice. That doesn't make sense. But that's God's solution. And that's, that's the beauty of, of the Bible is that it tells us something that blows our mind, that God loves us in spite of ourselves. Um, any questions on that first part? On the, the natural knowledge of God, revealed knowledge of God? So there's something 
I don't know what, something that we said about Hillary. Because they know, right? And it's why I'm making my body and I'm your body, and that's the spirit of God. And that's how children know. And as life comes along, that, that uh, what comes along? As life comes along, okay. and responsibility and adulthood and parenthood and death, killing and whatever comes, right? Um, it's easy. Or I'm speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for anybody else. Yeah. To know, to get further and further, only in my own. Um, I still know it's not the same as when I was a child. But as my children, and they're knowing mm -hmm. and asking questions. That you said long ago, and that didn't go back. Okay. I think there's uh, it's all accurate, is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And I, th I think bringing up the kids is, is really valuable because, I mean, think about kids have questions about that kind of stuff, right? Because they sense it too. Sometimes I think when, you know, we get to be adults, we, we convince ourselves not to ask some of those questions, right? Um, oh, I don't want to think about that. But then the kid comes along and says, but dad, what about this? And you're kind of forced to think about it, right? And then God works through all of that to, to get us to be looking for answers. And, and I praise God that he's, he's brought you here to be looking in the Bible for answers because that's where he gives us his answers. Um, awesome. Anything else on that first part? Well, then the second half of the first lesson is just a list of a bunch of things that God says about himself. So we're going to look at some, some attributes of God. Um, there are a lot of people out there with a lot of opinions about God. Um, you know, I, I might think that Vicar is a concert pianist. Um, I don't know if he is or not. Uh, Vicar, are you a concert pianist? Well, don't ask me to prove it. But... <laughs> okay. But uh, so, so he knows. I don't. I have to ask him, right? What's that? Oh, like a, a professional piano player. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but me just saying, hey, guess what, guys? This is what Vicar is. That doesn't make that what he is, right? He is what he is, and, and, you know, we can ask him, but we can't just assume things. A lot of people do that with God. If I were God, I'd be like this, or this is how I would do it. Um, well, that doesn't always work because thankfully I'm not God. He's much better. Um, you know, I, we need him to be a whole lot more powerful and, and wise than we are. Uh, so what we want to do is look at what does God say about himself. And when we do that, we're going to realize that all of these attributes are things that are kind of contrary to what, to what we naturally are. Um, so you start with the first one, God is a spirit, right? We're used to things with a physical body uh, that I can touch and taste and feel. Um, that's not God. Now, he can take physical forms, but in who he is, he, he doesn't need to. Brian, you want to play or pass on John 4, 24? I'll play. All right. God is spirit and his worship and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Okay. He is spirit. He's eternal. Uh, we are used to things with starts and finishes, beginnings and ends. Uh, and Terrell, you're driving. I'm not going to have you read. So, uh, so we'll, we'll move on to, to Jeremy here. Uh, you want uh, Psalm 90? Lord, we have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Where the mountains were born, where you brought forth the earth and the world, and everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Okay. Before the mountains were here, um, from, from everlasting to everlasting, you know, again, we know things that have starts and finishes. It's almost even hard to, to comprehend God's eternity. You know, I, I think I can understand God's eternity going forward, right? That he just never ends, that it'll always be. I think I get that. But when I start trying to think about that he's always been here, my mind just kind of rebels at that. Well, how did the world get here? Well, God made it. Well, how did God get here? Well, he, he always was. No, but when did he start? No, he always, he always was. And it's not even just that. It's also that he's not bound by time. He doesn't have to wait for one minute to pass to be at the next minute. He's at every point in time, at every point in time. So while he's creating the world, he's seeing us sitting here right now, and he's seeing us in heaven and he's seen his son dying for our sins and he, you know, he, he sees it all. Um, you know, he, he has the big picture. So he's eternal. 
Uh, and number three, God does not change. Uh, Matthew, you want to read the Malachi 3? Uh, sure. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the of Okay. Think about how much we change from day to day and year to year. Um, but God doesn't. He says, so you descendants of Jacob, you believers are not destroyed. If God changed his will for us or, or uh, his His guidance for us, we'd be in trouble. Um, but when he says something, he's, he's solid with it. He doesn't change. Uh, God is almighty. Uh, Genesis 17, he calls himself God almighty. In Matthew 19, he kind of describes what that looks like. That's uh, Matthew 19 is, is uh, after um, it says there was a rich young ruler that came up to Jesus and said, hey, you know, teacher, well, what do I have to do to be saved? Um, and he was kind of coming from it from a standpoint of, uh, I think I'm pretty good. I think I got this. You know, whatever you're going to say, I think I'll be okay. And Jesus says, oh, okay, well, uh, uh, have you kept all of the commandments? Have you been perfect? And he says, oh, yeah, no problem. I've kept all the commandments. And Jesus says, huh, okay. Um, well, then go home, sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. You know, put God first. Uh, and it says he went home sad because he had great wealth. Um, in other words, he had great wealth. So, so, you know, Jesus was demonstrating to him that he hadn't even kept the first commandment, right? Um, that uh, uh, he hadn't even put, he can't, he wasn't putting God first. He was putting his wealth first. Uh, and then the, the, uh, Jesus says how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. So the largest animal they were familiar with, the smallest opening they were familiar with. Um, he, and, and so one of the disciples says, so you're saying it's impossible? And that's when Jesus says this. Bob, you want to read that one? Where are we at? Matthew 19, 26. Yes. Jesus looked at him and said, The man is in the Bible, but the God all things are possible. Okay. It's impossible for us. Uh, there are no limits for God. Uh, he, is, he is almighty. And, and I think here's one of those places where we try to put God into a human shaped box. Um, I think a lot of times we think of God as really, really, really powerful. But that's not what he says, right? He says he's almighty. So there's no limit. Have you ever heard anyone say, well, I didn't want to bother God with that because it's such a small thing and, and he's busy. Well, no, there's no limits. There's no God getting busy. He has all the bandwidth, right? He, he can do it all. Uh, almighty. Um, can, can I? Yeah. What question? Right. Yeah. Isn't there a verse where he says, and I don't know if it's in Matthew or in a mirroring verse of another mm -hmm. chapter. Isn't there a verse where he plainly says, no man be my disciple lest he sell everything? Uh, well, so he, he says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Um, right, but I mean more particular to exactly what I just said. So it says, "No man be my disciple." I was about to do it, but I didn't want to believe it. Okay. Because um, I'm pretty sure it's a verse that says, "No man be my disciple, lest he give everything he owns away." I'm trying to think. There, there are some some passages where he talks about you know absolutely putting him first, um, but. I'll, I'll look into that. And, and it doesn't contradict anything that happens in Acts with the church either. In the pulling of resources. Sure. So they, they, um, I think there is. It's just the thing since we were on that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good question. I'll, I'll look into that and get back to you. But I don't think, um, I mean, in, in Acts, yeah, you have some of the, the followers who uh, are, are giving for the poor. And, you know, Peter even makes the comment, you didn't have to do that, right? It was yours. You could have done what you want. But you decided to, to give that. Um, yeah, so this is the one place I'm familiar of where he tells someone, sell it all, right? Uh, in his conversation with Lazarus, you know, uh, Le not Lazarus. Uh, yeah. Um, The tax collector. Uh, I'm thinking rich man and poor Lazarus. But there's also Lazarus, the, yeah, the same guy. Okay. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, that's the name I'm thinking of. Okay. 
Wow, that was a, a brain freeze. I've been, been up too long already today. Um, so Zacchaeus, where, you know, he talks about how his possessions had, um, you know, Zacchaeus says, I'm giving it all away. And Jesus says, today, uh, salvation has come to this house. But, but again, that was an individual demonstrating that he was no longer going to put that, that uh, stuff first. Um, but yeah, it looks sure Jesus saying Okay. Yeah, text me that, Pat. You know, if you find it, text me and we'll, we'll uh, begin next time talking about that. So, context, the word disciples, or is it just disciples? Just in Jesus' name, Jesus or are we talking? So, yeah, that, that word disciple is used in different ways in scripture. So, the, the word itself means a learner, right? Someone who is learning. Uh, and sometimes Jesus talks about, uh, well, in the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, right? Make learners of all nations, teach them, uh, baptize them and teach them. Uh, but then we also have places where it talks about Jesus disciples, specifically of that group of, uh, and, and here again, sometimes it's talking about the 12 disciples that are, are listed as those special followers of his that were his kind of, you know, inner group. But then sometimes it talks about the the rest that were following him and, and learning from him as well. Um, you know, the, the 500 that were there one time or, you know, uh, yeah. So the the word itself means someone who learns. And sometimes it's used specifically for that small group. So, yeah. Good. So, yeah, so we got God is almighty, not just really powerful. He's almighty. Uh, God knows all. You know, we, we might think we know a lot, and Google knows even more, right? But, but God knows all, and he knows what's true and what's not. Google doesn't always do a good job of that. Uh, but uh, let, let's read that one, Psalm 139, verse 4. Whose turn? Is that you, Vicar? Okay. Uh, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Let that one sink in for a second. Before I even say it, he knew what I was thinking um, that can be a scary thought, right? Um, it can also be a comforting thought. Me, so in the house that I grew up in, uh, most of my years were living upstairs. That's where most of the kids' rooms were. Um, and when you're walking up the stairs, there was a picture of Jesus right on the top of the staircase. So as, as you're walking up, uh, you see Jesus there. And it's one of those where uh, uh, the eyes have that white dot at 11 o'clock. You know what that does? So that no matter where you are, in the room, yeah, yeah, yeah. it looks like he's, he's looking at you. And uh, some days that was a freaky thing, right? You're going up the stairs and like, okay, Jesus, don't look at me. Other days it was great. Hey, Jesus is watching me. That's awesome. Um, what's the difference? Well, what was I just coming back from? What did I just done, right? Um, I don't want Jesus to see the, the bad stuff. But, but you think about it, how comforting it is that God knows everything. If you've ever had a friend that uh, uh, you knew something was wrong, but they wouldn't tell you what it was and you didn't know what was wrong, how do you help? Um, but with God, we never have to worry about that. Even if I'm ashamed to tell him what's wrong, he already knows. And he's the one that loved me so much that he sent his son. He's the one that's almighty that he can do something about it. Uh, so he knows all. What, what an amazing comfort uh, that, that, that he knows all. Uh, he's everywhere. Uh, you know, remember when uh, Adam and Eve sinned and then they heard God coming and, and what do they do? They, they hide. And you say, boy, that's silly, Adam and Eve. But um, well, we kind of do the same thing too, don't we? Uh, I'm feeling guilty and maybe not the first thing I want to do is pray or, or think about God being here watching me. Um, but God is everywhere, so we, we can't hide. Uh, he, he's always there for us, always searching for us. Number seven, God is holy. The Isaiah passage, you have the angels around the throne calling him holy, 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 holy. Uh, and here again, I think we try to put God in a human box. We like to think of God as really, 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 really good. Um, but no, he's more than that. He's holy. That's, 
That's the absolute opposite of sin. Holiness and sin cannot go together. One destroys the other. Sin destroys holiness because you're not holy anymore if you have sin. Or holiness has to destroy the, the sinner, right? I mean, it, that, that's justice. Um, and so God is holy. That means that God doesn't grade on the curve. Um, so often I think we try to convince ourselves that, well, as long as I'm as good as I can be, then that's good. No, if I want to be with God, I have to be holy. I have to be absolutely perfect. Um, now, thankfully, God sent his son to take my imperfection away and to give me his holiness, but, but, but I need that. I can't do this on my own because, um, because I'm not holy. Uh, but God is holy, completely different than us. And that's why he made the plan of, of Jesus. We'll talk about that next time. Um, so that we could be with him. We could be holy. Uh, God is faithful. Let's read 2 Timothy 2.13. You want that one, Glenette? Uh, yeah, 2 Timothy. Okay. You know, we make promises and try to keep them. God can't not keep them. Right? I mean, the, the, he's God. Uh, he cannot break a promise because then he wouldn't be God. And that's part of who he is. So you think about how, how awesome it is that even when we mess up, God is faithful to his promises. And God is good. Kat, you want Psalm 145? The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Okay. Well, pretty straightforward. The next one is, is an interesting one. And I think that sometimes people kind of lean on one side or the other of this pendulum, right? Where... Uh, uh, it's true that God is compassionate and gracious, and it's true that God is just. But I think people kind of take, so some people look at God as like, I call it the grandfather God, right? Moms and dads, they have to discipline, right? There's consequences for actions and all that, but grandma and grandpa, they get to spoil, right? Oh, I don't care what you did, I'm going to give you candy anyway, right? Some people think of God like that. Oh, he doesn't care what I do, he just loves me and he's going to give me everything. Um, well, that's not exactly understanding it right. Other people look at God as, you know, angry judge. Well, he's just waiting for me to mess up so he can zap me. Um, well, that's not exactly right. God is compassionate and gracious, and God is just. Uh, Nicole, you want to play your pass on Exodus 34? Brian's going to go, then I'll go after him. <laughs> okay, sounds good. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord. The compassion and the gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Okay. Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, forgiving, and then in the same breath, punishing. Um, and it sounds like, wait a second, that's, that's contradictory, right? Um, but this, this is who God is, that, that he is absolutely loving and forgiving. And yet at the same time, he doesn't just ignore sin. He has to deal with sin. Uh, sin needs to be punished. Uh, you know, if, if you, let's say someone you love was, was, was hurt, um, you know, there's a guy that, uh, that goes and, 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 and rapes this, this young woman and, and beats her and, and leaves her almost dead. And, and they catch him and they've got video evidence and he confesses. And uh, you, you go before the judge and everybody knows this is the guy who did it. And this was this awful thing. And, and then the judge says, uh, it's okay. You can go free. Um, no punishment. Uh, how do you feel about that? There's a problem there, right? we know justice has to be done. It's not okay just to say, oh, that, that can go free. And God doesn't. God punishes sin. The amazing over-the-top love of God says that he was willing to punish his son instead of us. Jesus said, no, I'll take the rap for what they've done. So justice is done um, as God is forgiving and loving. Any questions on that passage, that's one that sometimes brings up some yeah, discussion. The, the generational thing, speak about that a little bit. The generational thing. Okay, so uh, uh, you're talking about how he 
he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Yeah. And, and maybe I'm reading your mind that you read that and you say, wait a second, that doesn't sound fair, right? Is that where we're coming from? Okay, okay. Because you look at it and you're like, wait a second, why would he punish grandchildren if it's the grandparents that messed up, right? Um, and this is maybe a good time to talk about Bible interpretation. How do I know what he means there? Um, I could say, well, that must mean that God just isn't fair and he's going to do whatever he wants and he doesn't care about us. But that's not what God is saying. Um, when, when I look at something like this and I say, okay, which way are we supposed to take it? I, I think the first principle we want to always think about is, uh, does God explain this somewhere else? Does he help us to understand it? And he does. Actually, in Deuteronomy, uh, there's a very similar passage where it says that uh, God is compassion, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, forgiving, etc. Uh, but he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. And then this part is almost exactly the same. He punishes the children for the sins of the fathers of the third and fourth generation. And then it adds the phrase, of those who hate me. So it's not just that he's punishing the kids because their parents messed up. He's punishing them because they continue in the sin of the parents. Um, you know, and think about what a, what a powerful statement this is to parents. Uh, what are we training our kids in? Because because they they follow our example more so than they follow what we say. They see what we do, and and they they follow in that. You know, and even things like you know there are studies out there that if you grow up in a household of smokers, you're 84 percent more likely to be a smoker. If you grow up in a household where there's abuse, you're 82 percent more likely to get in a relationship where there's abuse. You know, we we learn things and we pass them on. Um, so for the people of Israel that are at this point getting ready to enter the promised land and they're going to have all these other gods around them um, and God says this is who I am uh, but the parents say you know what um, I think we're going to go with this Canaanite God and we're going to worship Molech for a while well if they're worshiping Molech what are they teaching their kids to worship Molech and so what are the kids doing what do they teach their grandkids they're passing that down and, and God says that that's not okay that's a responsibility for the parents and and actually, um, there's another place uh, in Ezekiel where um, God addresses this. The people of Israel actually come to God and they're like, hey, this isn't fair. We're getting punished because our grandparents messed up and now we're in exile. Um, and, uh, and God says, oh, you're not going to. Let me, let me just kind of scan that. That's uh, in Ezekiel 18. Um, he says, uh, you're not going to you're not going to complain like that anymore. It says uh, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, our parents messed up and we're getting the brunt of it. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For every living soul belongs to me. The father as well as the son, both alike belong to me. The soul who sins is the one who will die. So it's not just because I'm a grandchild of someone who messed up. It's because I'm doing that sin too. And then, then he goes through in that chapter and, and tells a story. And he says, imagine there's a guy. Uh, we'll call him Grandpa for the purpose of this story. And Grandpa does the right things. And he uh, worships the Lord. And he doesn't go to Molech. And he doesn't you know, uh, go to the high places. And he doesn't kill people. Uh, he's doing the right things. But, but Grandpa has a son uh, who... Uh, turns away from the ways of the Lord and, and goes to the high places and worships the false gods and, 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 and commits adultery and all these other things. But that guy has a son, so grandson, who realizes what his dad's doing is wrong and turns to the Lord and does the right things. And, and so God says, what do you think? Is this guy going to get rewarded because of his dad? No, he's punished because of his sins. Is this guy going to get punished because of his dad? No, he's rewarded uh, because of his faithfulness and his faith. Um, and, and he repeats it like six times in that chapter. The soul who sins is the one who will die. So when, when you read that, that he punishes the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, it's those who are continuing in that sin. Um, and it's those who, by faith, are turning to the Lord, um, who have the, the forgiveness and the compassion and, and all of that. Does that make sense? Did I get your question, Bob? Did I answer? No, no? It's okay. Okay. You want to try again? What did I miss? No, okay. I'm not very little. Okay. I just have to look through. Okay. Okay. okay.
All right. But I will tell you immediately after that, he, I was just reading that, that the Lord was saying that Moses, and then immediately after that, he makes kind of an adverse covenant with his people for the generations on the good side, not on the side of I will punish you all. But yeah, you know I mean? yeah, he, he makes promises to his people. So he's he's serious about sin, but he's also serious about his promises of grace and forgiveness. Uh, and, and that's an interesting thing. You know, as we go through God's word, you're going to see those two messages side by side. The law saying, you've messed up, you deserve punishment. And the gospel saying, you're perfect and forgiven. I'm like, wait a second, I'm not perfect, but, but God declares me so. Old Testament, New Testament. That, actually, no. Um, so by law, I'm talking about the commands of God, the decrees of God, the, the punishment of God, the wrath of God, um, where uh, do this or you get this punishment. Um, and, and that you see throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, and then gospel. By gospel, I'm talking about the promises of God. And actually, in, in chapter three, we dig into this a little bit more, and we're going to look at the law and the gospel and how they differentiate. Um, but it's more than just Old Testament and New Testament God. It's the same God throughout, throughout all of it. Um, you know, the, the same God who created the world and promised the Savior. I mean, that's an Old Testament God, uh, but it's the same God, right? It's, it's not a different God in each of those. Uh, the same one. Um, but we see them in different time frames in each. And we'll talk more about that in, in lesson three. Um, good. So, uh, yeah, God's compassion and gracious. God is just. Anything else on that one? All right, number 11, God is good. Uh, that's pretty straightforward, right? Or God is love. I'm sorry. Uh, 1 John 4, 8. Nicole, you said you were going to take this one? Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Okay. Um, we can feel love. We can show love. We can have love. But God is love. Everything he does, everything he is, is love. So even his punishing of sins is love, because he wants something better for us. Um, and then the last one, God is a triune God. Uh, the word triune or trinity, those words don't actually show up in the Bible, but we use them because they describe what the Bible describes. Uh, triune, tri like a tricycle, three, yun like a unicycle, one. Really, literally, it's just three in one. Uh, so we have a, a three in one God um, because the Bible says there is one God. Uh, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 um, I guess we're back in the room. Jeremy, you want that one? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay. One God, only one God. Uh, there are no other gods. Passage after passage in Scripture says there is only one God. And yet, when God describes himself, he names three persons. Um, Matthew 28, you see uh, uh, Jesus in the Great Commission Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians, you see that blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Spirit be with you. Matthew 3, 16 and 17, this is from uh, Jesus' baptism. So when Jesus began his ministry, John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan River. Jesus comes up to him and says, John, I want you to baptize me. And John says, why do you need to be baptized? You don't have any sin. You know, you're, you're God's son. Um, but Jesus says, I'm doing this to fulfill all righteousness. And so then John does it. You know, Jesus was stepping into our place. He was doing what we needed. And then this is what happened. Matthew, you want to read, read Matthew 3, 16, 17 there? Okay, so you see Jesus, the Son, standing there in the water. You see the Father speaking from heaven. You see the Spirit descending in the form of a dove. And you say, that's three, right? And yet the Bible says there is one. Um, it's one of these things that 
my mind does not grasp. I don't get how this is. You know, you've, you've got the, the picture there that doesn't help it make sense, but that explains what the Bible says, right? The Bible says that the Father is not the Son, right? It was the Father speaking, the Son was standing there in the water. The Son is not the Spirit. Uh, Jesus said he sent out the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father, and yet the Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. And not that they're each a part of God, but they are each 100% absolutely fullness of God. You know, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, the Bible says. Um, so the math of it, one plus one plus one equals one. My mind says, no, wait a second, that's got to be three. No, one plus one plus one equals one. And here's where I take some comfort that I can't understand everything about God. Because if my mind could grasp everything about God, he wouldn't be that much of a God. He'd, he'd be another guy. Um, but since he is beyond me and bigger than me, I'm okay saying, all right, this is just something I don't fully understand, but this is what you say. So I believe it. It's like the, the teenager saying, okay, dad, I don't get why you want me to save money. Um, and, and then when all of a sudden they want to buy that car, oh, now I get it. Um, in heaven, maybe we'll get it. But, uh, but right now, we just trust, okay, God, this is what you say. All right. So any questions on the Trinity? Uh, yeah, Matthew. So, um, when you say, like, God's um, prayer and everything, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, and that's so the, the dogmaticians talk about how when the Bible describes the works of the Trinity, that the the um, we can't divide some of those those works like like two between them there's there seems to be division in the work, but when it comes to God interrelating with us. We can't fully divide it. So like normally the Bible talks about the father being the creator, right? But then it also has passages where it says, you know, the son, nothing was created without him and all things were created through him. Or, you know, the, the spirit hovered over the face of the deep and he was there. It was the word that was used to, to, to create, you know, he, God breathed into the man the breath of life, the, the, the spirit of life. So um, all three were involved. Usually we think of the son as the redeemer. You know, the one who paid for our sins. And yet the Bible also talks about the Father as the, the Redeemer. Or, you know, the Spirit being the Sanctifier, the one who brings us to faith. And yet the Bible also talks about the Father and the Son being part of that work. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's hard for us to fully understand that. But, yeah, normally the Bible speaks of, you know, one of the persons leading in a specific work, if that makes sense. Uh, good question. Anything else on that? Yes. yes. So how do you do you know, that? Mm -hmm. So with the uh, candles, just that would that be like a divine of the Holy Spirit? So, so the um, those of you online, she was asking about you know when when someone crosses themselves or like in church when I in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, what I'm doing there, what we're doing is making the sign of the cross remembering how God connected us to him, right? There was a gap between us and God. There was uh, 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 our sins separated us from God. And then Jesus came, he died on the cross. And that cross, that, that work of Jesus covered that gap. Uh, and so when we, when we uh, name God in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. You know, when, when we say that in, in worship at the beginning of the service, we're remembering our baptism. When we were brought into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, we, we use that hand signal to remind us of the cross, of the work of God for us in connecting us to him. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Um, so yeah, so really, it's, it's really talking about the second person of the Trinity, the one who died on the cross. And, and yeah, it's not really the, um, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit, although it's the Holy Spirit that works faith in our heart and, and all of that. Does that make sense? Okay. Is there a reason for the direction? <laughs> so you wouldn't know uh, this way. Uh, what's Just the tradition. <laughs> tradition. And it's one of those things that as tradition develops, people sometimes, you know, make up some other stuff around it, like, uh, uh, 
for a while, you know, if, if you made a left-handed cross, that meant that you were you were saying something uh, something negative, and but just different things that come up. But the the sign of the cross is designed to to remind us of what Jesus did for us. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. And so the Trinity, so God is just outside of space and time because we're linear. Is that why Christ came in the flesh? Because there had to be. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. So to um, to connect with us so that we could grasp something, so that uh, He could relate to us, um, and actually that's a lesson. Lesson three, we get into that. Jesus taking foot or the Son of God taking flesh and all of that. So so we'll dig into that more in lesson three. So you guys have given a good preview of two and three already, um, which which is good stuff. That means we're talking about the right things in here. Um, I will leave that last passage. We'll start with that next time. But but I do want to get the two, the 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 little quiz there. True or false quiz. Uh, number one, true or false. There are three distinct persons in the Trinity. True, right. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, true or false, there are three separate gods. False. God says there's only one God. Again, I don't get how that works, but um, if the Father is God and the Son is God and the Spirit is God, and God says there's only one God, okay, three in one. So there's only one God. That one is, that one is false. Number three, the Father existed before the Son and the Spirit. False. Okay. That's one that a lot of times trips us up because... Um, you're right, it's false because God is unchanging. Uh, God is eternal. So one was not before the other. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit always have been, always will be. But I think sometimes it gets confusing because we think of Jesus, right? Jesus, the Son of God, took flesh at a certain point in time. But that wasn't his beginning. Uh, the Son of God was always there. It was just at a time that he took flesh. Um, you know, we talked about how he was there when, when the earth was made. Uh, from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. Good. Um, and like I said, we'll, we'll cover that last passage at the beginning of next time. Any other questions? I apologize. I, I took you five minutes long, but uh, you guys have good questions. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, go, go ahead, Nicole. Um, quick question is probably off the screen a little bit, but I'm curious to know since we're talking about the Trinity. So we do in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Yep. And they do the thing in the Catholic Church, but they're not worshiping a God, they're worshiping Mary. I'm confused about that. Okay. So um, getting into what, what some other churches teach. So like the official teaching of the Catholic Church would be that they do believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They, they would teach the triune God. Uh, but you're right, they do elevate Mary and, and even some of the other saints uh, beyond where they should be elevated, right? I mean, Mary, um, the angel said all generations would call her blessed. Absolutely. We, we praise God for using Mary in a very special way to be the, the mother of Jesus. Uh, but... She was not uh, a holy or perfect or, uh, you know, they, there are other teachings that have grown up around her that, uh, that she was born without sin. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. She says that she's, you know, the humble state of your servant. Uh, uh, she knew that she needed God's forgiveness and, and all of that. Um, and yes, some of the teachings of the Catholic Church do lift her up and even make her co-redemptrix. Um, that uh, that salvation comes through her, where the Bible doesn't say that. Um, and we'll we'll actually get to talk about that more in a uh, lesson. That one's later on. Uh, I forget which one, but I know I know that one comes up again. Um, and we'll talk about some of the things that different churches teach. Uh, but again, our goal is to say what does the Bible say, and the Bible says that she was a human just like us that God used in a special way. Um, so no, we don't worship her. She's not God. Uh, she is a, a creature of God. Um, Isn't that the reason for their churches and the Protestants? Right. That's where the really the the Reformation came from. Is the the Catholic Church had several different teachings that were going away from what Scripture um, was saying, and so we want to say, okay, what does the Bible say, and 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 let's be real about that, uh, and not. Not try to get 
I don't know, shortcuts to God or things like that. God has given us direct access to him through Jesus. We don't have to pray to Mary. We don't have to pray to the saints. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that more too when we talk about prayer. And actually that's lesson 11. So, but did I, did I answer your question? Kind of, sort of, in a different okay. way. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, if you want... Uh, bring it back to the beginning next time and I'll, I'll take another crack at it and I'll, I'll maybe understand it better. Glenette, did you have uh, a question too? I didn't okay. The question is, where did the name Jesus come from? Hmm? I was having a discussion with um, Dr. Hall about that. Where did the name Jesus come from? Okay. All right, so actually, you know what? I'm going to write because I can give a lot longer answer than I don't want to keep you guys too late. But the name, I'm going to write that down and we'll start next time with it. Okay. Does that work? So, uh, um, yeah, Greek Yeshua uh, or Hebrew Yeshua, Greek uh, Jesus. Uh, with the the yo the little y sound, but but we'll we'll get into that uh, we'll get into that more because that's a that's a really good good question, good thing to talk about. Um, so why don't we close with prayer? Because I try to respect your time. I know that people have a lot of things going on, and and I want us to be able to plan for an hour. And uh, uh, I apologize for taking a little bit extra this time, but um, I'm having fun. Hope you are too. So let, let's close with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us this time in your word and the opportunity to to work with one another at understanding your word bless us send your spirit that that we may keep growing in our relationship with you and with each other in jesus name we pray it amen, amen. thank you pastor you're welcome see you next sunday okay see you, Kat. Luke 14, is the... the one you were thinking about yeah Okay, so in that uh, um, 